Uh, as I stand before you, let me first give you my name. I'm Todd Yeary, the uh, senior pastor of the Douglas Memorial Community Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, born in the Deep South in Augusta, Georgia, uh, in the middle of the 60s. And so, as you will note, the lights are coming on because a black dude from the Deep South in a dark place <laughs> in a town called Lynchburg. <laughs> but really, I wanted us to be able to see one another because very often uh, we're not able to make connections when we're talking about revival. And so I want to thank uh, Shane and Don and Tony and all of the team for calling us together as community for a serious recommitment to the principles of discipleship. The reason that's important is because if we're not careful, we'll be good at reciting scripture and poor at representing what scripture really means. We'll stop reading when it's convenient and miss the fact that if we don't tell the whole story, we'll miss the story altogether. So I wanted to take a few minutes tonight, I hope you don't mind, uh, as we begin this conversation. Can you look at somebody that now you can see because the light's on? Uh, look at your neighbor and say, I see you now. Helps you to relax when you know that you've been seen, not wondering who's sneaking up behind you. Uh, because we're not called to be insecure. We're called to be authentic. What's going on here is raising the consciousness of folks near and far. Some would retort that this response is really a political one. They'll give us the cliche of Matthew 22, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which, is, that which is God's. If you're not careful, you'll stop reading too soon. So I thought maybe tonight since somebody wanted to stop in Matthew 22, that I'd share for just a few moments tonight from Matthew 23. Tell your neighbor, keep reading. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you do and observe but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by people for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by people. But do not be called rabbi for one is your teacher and you are all siblings. Do not call anyone on earth father for only one is your parent, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. I believe in this season there's a revival of authentic Christianity, it's a Christianity not of posture, but of presence. Not of importance, but of relevance. Not just to give sound bites, but to give substance. We live in a day and a time when the creative gamesmanship of the last quarter century around religion that wants us to treat God like the genie in the bottle, but not the Christ of the scriptures. 
is now calling us to get back to the business of being who God has called us to be. I will tell you up front this disclaimer, as I often have heard, uh, a prophet is a preacher from out of town. And, and, and so since I'm visiting for a moment, let me just drop this on you and I'll be on my way uh, not to get in your hair because we've got things to do tonight and be back in place in the morning. Be careful of religious folk who talk the talk but can't walk the walk. Be careful of those who sit high and look down on folks that they should be lifting up. Be careful that we don't give too much credibility to those who have grown in size but have not yet risen to the level of authentic significance. Because if we're not careful, we'll start talking about Jesus instead of living like Jesus. Just wanna to talk to, I ain't talking about anybody in particular, but I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. As the young folk would say, if we're gonna be about authentic Christianity, we've gotta recognize that a Christianity that is good on sound bites, but not relevance, turns a blind eye to the issues of justice for the poor, the homeless, the helpless, the hopeless, to the immigrant, if we're not careful, we'll revise scripture to make it suit our ends. Instead of understanding that scripture makes room for those who otherwise would have no place. If we were to be honest about it, we must come back to the, the truism that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And but for the provision of grace, none of us can come in and attempt to do that which we think is helpful. If we're gonna be sincere about being disciples on this week, where several days ago we came together to celebrate an empty tomb, how do we celebrate resurrection on Sunday and go back to indifference to injustice just a few days later? Even in Lynchburg, we gotta deal with the fact that 15% of folks in Lynchburg live in poverty. 24%. I'll take 24. We got, whatever it is, it's too many. And as we get cool on the numbers, what is God calling us to do? When folks are wrestling with where they're gonna lay their heads, where they're gonna find their next meal, who's gonna at least acknowledge their humanity while we're so busy running from those that simply want to pray with us and we with them. We gotta be careful in the age of revisionist history and revisionist religion that we can't just change the story to suit our ends and think that somehow or other no one's gonna check us. Check us on the real, honest to goodness story. We can't come to a place called Lynchburg and not have an honest conversation about ethnic displacement and racial indifference. We can't come to a place and just gloss over the fact that this, this place has a history and it's not a history that was just revived when certain entities and institutions came to town. Can't get no help here. If I were to go back to my Baptist leanings and my Baptist roots, we live in an age now that we believe Jesus was born in America. And if we were to be honest about it, in the current political climate, had Jesus been in America today, he would be on ISIS radar. Trying to make sure he could not face deportation because can I tell you the truth about it? If we go back and look at the great, great grandmother of King David, you remember her name? Her name is Ruth. She was an, an, an undocumented sister who got back into Bethlehem on a family visa provision. Yeah. 
So chain migration that we're trying to outlaw was actually the gateway to salvation for all of the rest of us. And so before we try to deport the DACA recipients, you must first decide, will you deport the, the universal immigrant named Jesus Christ? Hear what they say, don't do what they do. There's a difference between recitation and representation. Ask your neighbor who you with. No, ask the other neighbor because they were afraid you were gonna ask them something, <laughs> might require them to give an answer. But it's time for the few who have the power to stand up against the many who still pretend it. If Jesus could change the world with initially 12 disciples, look around the room and tell your neighbor, we got more than enough. There are more than enough authentic believers in the principles of Jesus Christ to change the world. But we first must move beyond merely listening and embodying. I didn't want to take up much time. I, I came this way because I heard folk who loved the Lord were getting together and having a little revival. I like revival. I like where two or three gather together in the name of the Lord to say God is good. But here's how we can be serious about this next move. I talked at the beginning about revising history. We all have a story. We all have a story with a few details that we wish we could probably write differently, but for the grace of God. And so I don't have to be ashamed of where I've come from and nor should you. We all meet at the intersection of need and grace. That amazing grace that saves one saves all. And it is a non-exclusive invitation. God is not leaving anybody out of this next move. We just want to know, is there anybody that doesn't just want to talk about it, you want to be about it. If you want to be serious about what God is doing, high five your neighbor and say, count me in. That was the wrong neighbor. High five the other neighbor and say, count me in. And just so we can fill the room with the shouts of victory that say God is on our side. If God has been good to you in spite of the story that you've inherited, can you just thank God for saving you and sparing you and encouraging you and providing for you and sustaining you and protecting you because God is good. I said God is good. I said God is good. Let the church say amen.